Hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Awesome. Well, hey, I'm glad that you guys are here this morning. Uh, just like Hope said, I know we've got some guests here in the room. If it is your first time here, we may even give you a little bit of a break if it's your second time here, too. We're glad that you're here. Glad you chose us to worship with this morning. And I will challenge you, um, unlike Hope, that if you don't know somebody here, um, we're going to give you the opportunity now to go meet them, shake their hand. I want to challenge you to shake the hand of one person that you know and one person that you don't know. So y'all get after it.
break the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness it tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope you could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, take my thoughts and stand for me. You have broken every chain. This salvation is Oh 
Good morning, church. Praise God. It's so good to be here this morning with each one of you. Thankful that you um, put forth the the effort and the sacrifice to be here uh, this morning. Before we jump into things, I want to to say that uh, uh, we have a marriage madness class coming up this Friday night at 7 o'clock right here. So please, I know there's a lot of other activities, Friday night football and all those things, but if you can be here this Friday night, please make plans to do that. We will have a, a really, really uh, good time. And so please make plans to, to do that. Also, as Hope mentioned, next week is the official Back to Church uh, Sunday. It's not just a cornerstone thing. That's a national, uh, national event, a national thing. And so I was looking at the jar. Maybe it's filled up since I, since I come in here this morning. But uh, the jar wasn't very full of the, the bouncy balls. So you know what that means? You know what that tells me? We're not inviting people. I'll let you chew on that. Enough said about that. We'll move on. We'll move on. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's jump into this. I'm going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. I'll start out in verse 19 if you want to start, begin uh, pulling that up. But how many of you like to be invited to certain events, parties, activities, uh, things of that nature? Now, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be a little bit transparent. There are some things that I get really excited about being invited to, and then there's some things like, you know what? Y'all go on ahead without me on that one, right? But I remember as a kid, as a child, anytime I got invited to a birthday party, that was an exciting thing to me. You know, that was a, 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 a fun time, an exciting thing to, to get invited to a birthday party. Most of the time, all your friends were going to be there. There's going to be cake and ice cream and and, and presents, either you got to go pick out that special gift for your buddy, for your friend, or if it was your party, then all your buddies and your friends got to bring you something. So it was, uh, it was an amazing thing. It's, it's an amazing thing to, to be invited to, to somebody's party, uh, uh, to somebody's birthday party. But what I want to look at this morning and what I want us to understand, at least part of the message is, because of Jesus, we have the invitation to be a part of God's family. Now, that's one invitation I don't want to miss out on. That's one invitation that I am thankful that I have received, that it it was sent out to me. And and we participate in that family. One way that we participate in that family is through the assembling or the getting together of God's people known as the church, the church. And so um, what is church? We We need to remind ourselves church is taken from the Greek word ekklesia, It's a calling out, a religious congregation, a Christian community of members on earth, in heaven, or both. And so it's a, it's, it's simply put, it's a group of God's people coming together. And hopefully this morning, all over this country, all over the world, there's a group of God's people meeting together in some way, shape, or form. Just so happens that this group of people, we get to meet at 102 South Polk in Wagner, Oklahoma, in this building. In this building. There's others that are meeting in storefronts. There's others that are meeting in, in living rooms. There's, there's probably some meeting in tents, the parking lot, wherever it may be. There are God's people are meeting this morning, hopefully. We know from last week's scripture message that Jesus is the foundation on which his church was built. And he's the perfect foundation. If something goes wrong in the church, it isn't because of the foundation. It's because of something else. And so uh, we, we, we learned that. We talked about uh, uh, the foundation on which the church is built is Jesus. We learned that the forces of hell, the forces of evil, will not prevail against God's, against Jesus' church. won't happen. The church will exist in one way, shape, or form. Uh, we are on the winning team. Now, I don't know about you, but I like to be on the winning team. Anybody in here just like losing? I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Nobody signs up to lose, right? 
And so uh, I'm thankful that we are on the winning team. God's, uh, uh, God has won. Jesus has won through his work on the cross. And we get invited into that victorious uh, situation and, and relationship. We also understand that the relationship Jesus has with the church is that he gave himself for the church. He sacrificed so that you and I could be a part of the church, ecclesia, the community of followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? He gave himself uh, for that, and because of that sacrifice, each and every one of us have a personal invitation into the family of God, into the family of God. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, we'll start in verse 19. This is probably one of the most popular uh, of, uh, passages of Scripture when we get on down into to the verses 24 and 25, probably one of the most uh, popular, one of the most famous, one of the most taught and preached about when it, when it comes to being a part of God's church. This is probably one of them that is, is used uh, the most often. And so I want you to, to, to read with me in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Is God's church ready to go this morning? Yeah. All right, verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, and so we got to understand right here, this, this passage of Scripture is talking to God's people. It's talking to followers of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ is being spoken to right here in this passage of Scripture. It goes on and says, Therefore, having boldness, or that is confidence, confidence, and, and, I, and I tell the young athletes that I get to be around, that I'm blessed to be around, there's a difference between confidence and arrogance. Confidence and arrogance. Confidence in is, 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 is knowing that, that you have the God-given ability to do something, but you also know that that ability comes from God, and you have the confidence to do that. And so here it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness or confidence to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we got to stop right there, and we got to unpack that a little bit because we got to understand what is being referenced. And back in the Old Testament and, and the, under the Old Covenant, and, and Hebrews is a bridge from the Old Covenant to the completed New Covenant through Jesus Christ. Okay, It doesn't mean that the Old Covenant goes away. It doesn't mean that the Old Covenant is bad. It, it's still wrong to kill somebody. It's still wrong to commit adultery. It's still wrong to have any other gods before the God. Right? It's still wrong to steal, kill, and destroy. Right? It's still wrong to do that. But, but where the Old Covenant fell short, Jesus completed it. See, the Old Covenant couldn't save us. The Old Covenant couldn't save us. That can only happen through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, as we'll, as we'll look at it. So Jesus didn't do away with the Old Covenant. He completed it. He made it perfect. He made it perfect. And so here, how the Old Covenant was set up back then, when people went to church or went to the temple, there was a certain area in the temple that the regular person couldn't go, that the church attendee couldn't go. And it was known as the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, you and I couldn't get in there. Only the high priest could go past that. And it was separated by a veil. And we'll read about that here in just a second. And the only person that could go behind that veil was the high priest. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. It was representative of the presence of God. And you and I, at that time under the Old Covenant, weren't able to be in the presence of God inside the temple in that manner. It would be like this. It would be like we. this is the worship center. Some call it the sanctuary. It would be like us locking those doors, and the, as far as you could go would be the lobby. And then you would have to come to me. You'd have to do your sacrifice. You'd have to do your, your confession, your repentance, and then I would have to come in here and do that on your behalf in the presence of God. Simply put. Simply put. We don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to do that anymore. And so here he says, you can come confidently to enter the, holy, the, the holiest by the blood of Jesus. I don't have to go to a man anymore to confess my sins. I can go right to the God. I can be right in the presence of the Almighty God. Of Almighty God. And I can do that with confidence and boldness. Not arrogance, confidence and boldness knowing that through Jesus Christ I have that ability. I have that invitation through His Son, Jesus Christ. God invited me into His presence. 
When Jesus took on the cross and His work on the cross, that was an invitation for me to be in the Father's presence. In the Father's presence. And I can do that confidently and boldly. I no longer have to confess anything to man. I can go right to God Himself. Right to God Himself. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that we shouldn't share with each other, that we shouldn't lean on each other, that we shouldn't help each other in times of struggle, in times of need. Absolutely, it's what we're here for. We'll get into that in just a second as well. But our first step should be to go to God. It could be to go to God, and we can do that boldly and confidently through the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, by a new and living way which He consecrated or dedicated for us through the veil. Now, i got to stop right there because going back to, to the temple and the way it was set up, what separated that area of the temple was a veil. What happened when Jesus died on the cross? There was an earthquake. What happened to the veil? The veil was split. It was torn in two. Why? It wasn't needed anymore because Jesus became the veil. Jesus became the veil. And if, I ha- if I'm in relationship with him, I get to go behind the curtain. I get to go behind the curtain. I have an invitation to go behind the curtain. I get an invitation to go behind the veil. And it says, through his flesh, his flesh. Jesus is the veil on which we can enter into a relationship with the Father or the present. He's the invitation on which we get to to enter into a relationship with him. That's why that's why at the end of every message, whether it's a, a necessarily a, a call to salvation or whatever type of message it is, there will always be an invitation not to come before me, not to come before your other brothers and sisters in Christ, not to come before the church, to come before the presence of God. Because we have to freely, openly, boldly, and confidently, we get to do that. That's an invitation I don't want to miss. That's an invitation I don't want to miss. And so... Here we're we're, we're looking at that, and and over in um, John uh, chapter 14 and verse 6, and you can just write this down and look it up later. John 14 and 6, Jesus was speaking, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. And we exist today as Cornerstone Church, as a Peace built upon that foundation that is Jesus to help lead people to the way and to the truth and to the life. Amen? Amen? And so here, then it goes on in verse 21 and it says, and having a high priest over the house of God. Now that, the ultimate high priest is Jesus. This is God's house. Jesus is the high priest. And anything that is said, done, any activity, any action that is said, done here is subject to Jesus' approval. He is the high priest. He is my boss. He is my savior. He is my savior. And, and, And so he is the high priest of this place. No longer is, is, are you required to go to a high priest? He is the high priest. He is the high priest. Now, he has set it up in a way that that if you have a pastor, if you don't like it, talk to Jesus about it. But that's the way he set it up. And, and I am just here to do and share what God wants, what Jesus wants. And so I pray for all of us. And having a high priest over the house of God. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, what, that, that's a lot right there. What does that mean? Worship from a true heart. See, when, before we came into this, this building this morning, our heart should have been, we should have been asking God, asking Jesus, asking the Holy Spirit to begin to prepare our hearts for worship. And you don't have to answer this out loud, but, but how many of you did that this morning? And trust me, I know, I got three, I got three kids, and, and they, it can be hectic at times. I mean, it was so hectic this morning, I drove my own truck here. Just kidding, it wasn't. We, we, got, we got other things, we got to go separate ways after church. But, but um, I know having a family and having, you know, life can make it, make it hectic, but we've got a purpose in our heart. What this passage of Scripture right here, verse 22, is telling us, when you come into the house of the Lord, 
And this is God's house. We need to be prepared to worship. And, and, and that happens through prayer, through study, through speaking to God, preparing my heart. Whatever is weighing on my heart right now, God, God set, let's set that aside so I can come in and glorify you. That's what God's people are, are, are designed to do. That's what Jesus wants. Us, that's the invitation to the party so that we can come in here and glorify God. And worship Him. And receive the word that He has set aside for us today. Today. So we need to prepare to worship uh, with a true heart. From a true heart. That is, that is with, with complete sincerity and purpose. The only agenda when we walk into this place is to worship Him. And to receive what He has for us. And He's always got something for us. He's always got something for us. Whether you like the message or not, whether you like the way it's presented or not, I am who I am. God's created me to be who I am to be. If you, if you want to change it, talk to Him. But, but it doesn't matter. There is always something that you can receive if you come in with your heart prepared. If you come in with your heart prepared, He's going to give you what you stand in need of. He's going to supply what you stand in need of in his body of believers. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so that's the sacrifice. That's the sacrifice. See, no longer because Jesus completed the covenant, no longer do I have to go to a man, no longer do I have, we're not sacrificing animals this morning. The sacrifice is a personal sacrifice. The sacrifice is, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go be a part of what God's got going on in His family today. I'm going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a part of that. And I'm going to do that from, a, from pure motives, pure agenda, and a pure heart, and a true heart. And when we do that, we become justified through the blood of Jesus Christ and the sanctifying cleansing of the word of the gospel. The word of the gospel sanctifies us in the eyes of God when we receive it and apply it to our heart. That's why this is so important. That's why corporate worship is so important. But it's, it, it, it's not just corporate worship. You can do that also on your own individual time, but it's so powerful to come in and be the church that Jesus calls us to be. Amen? Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Is faithful. So we're to come in here prepared, ready to worship. We're to come in here with, with pure intentions, pure motives, ready to go, ready to glorify God, ready to glorify our Savior, ready to receive whatever it is, whatever spiritual nourishment that He has for us, for us. And then that helps us hold fast to our faith. That helps us hold fast to our faith without wavering. And, and there is so many things in this world right now trying to get us to waver. Trying to get us to waver. I mean, we look at, we look at, at, at we celebrated our, our Ellie's birthday yesterday. And we went out to eat with some family. And I was talking with some, some family members. I think it was Amy's dad specifically. And we look at the events of the people, of God's people in the Bible. And it's, it's easy for us to look at them and say, why did they do that? Because, and the reason that's easy for us to say is because we see the end result. We see the end result. And we, and we talked about specifically about them walking around the walls seven times, the walls of Jericho. And they must have thought, how silly is that? We must look ridiculous doing that. I mean, there was people up on the wall making fun of them, probably throwing things at them. And, they, and, 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 and making fun of them and probably spitting on them and calling them all kinds of names. And here they are, just walking around seven times. And they must have thought, how ridiculous is this? And we thought, yeah, because we got to read the end of the story. We know what the end result, but they didn't know that when they were walking around those walls. Guess what? There's, a, there's, a, there's an end result coming for all of us as well, and we've not experienced it yet. And there may be people in this world that look at us and say, boy, you're, why are you wasting your time with all that? Why are, you, why are you participating in all that? 
you keep walking around the wall. You keep walking around the wall. There's an end result coming that we haven't experienced yet. And there's people in heaven going, if you just keep on walking, huh? If you just keep on walking, you're going to experience the greatness of God. If we hold fast to our hope without wavering, because God is always faithful to his people. God is always, he's always been faithful to me, even when I didn't deserve it, even when I didn't deserve it. Verse 24, here's where we're getting into the two verses that are probably the most popular, probably the most read when, it, when you're, you're talking about, you're preaching about, you're teaching about um, being together as God's family known as Ecclesia, the church. Verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So here, he tells us, let us consider one another. What, what, is that, what does that mean? What, is that, what does that look like? Have you ever, have you ever told your, your kids or, or been told yourself, boy, you need to be considerate to other people? What does that mean? That means you should consider them before you consider yourself. But oftentimes, we walk into God's family, and the only thing we're considering is ourselves. And what's in it for me? And, 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 and how, how am I going to be fed? And how, how's this or that going to happen and take place? But that's not what God, that's not how Jesus said us. not what God's called us to. When we come together in His presence with each other, is when we walk into those doors, or even outside of these doors, when we're in the presence of godly people, the church, ecclesia, a meeting of Christian people, of, of Christ followers, we should consider each other completely and totally, purely, with a true heart, without agenda. Without agenda. And let us consider one another. Why? Why would we do that? Why would we do that? I mean, let's be honest. People can be jerks sometimes. Even Christian people. Sometimes Christian people can be the biggest jerks. Amen. Let us consider one another in order. Why? Why? Why consider one another? I mean, that's not what society to teach, teaches us. It's all about you. Get what you, get what you can get. No matter who you, who you step on to get it, just get it. Right? And let us consider one another. Why? In order to stir, oh, there's some stirring. There's always some stirring. Some way, shape, or form, they're going to be some stirring. In God's church, in Jesus' church, he wants us to stir. But where does he want us to stir? Stir up love. Stir up love. That's what he did. That's what he did. He stirred up love. Stir up love. And what? Good works guess what we got work to do as god's people we got work to do see a lot of times we think that when we accept jesus christ as my savior that's the end i'm good to go i can go out and do whatever i want however i want whenever i want wrong when you accept jesus christ as your savior you're now a new creation you're a new create uh, creature in jesus christ and what you used to do probably not what you should do Moving forward in your life. At least it wasn't for me. And so now I'm a new creature, a new creation. That wasn't the end. That was the beginning of a new life, of a new birth, of a new direction, of a new path. And we're to stir each other up to that. And you do that by loving each other and loving those outside. That's why this, this invite campaign, whatever you want to call it, it's so important. It's more than just putting some rubber ball in a, in a, in a glass jar. That's fun, and that's cool, and that was a great idea by Keaton to, 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 to stir us up and give us a visual aid to see how well or how terrible we're doing. Right? But it's, it's more than just about handing somebody a card and inviting them to church. What you're inviting them to is the party. I'm going to tell you right now, I know some of you really well. And if you're about to, to throw some kind of social event, some kind of big party, you're going to be excited about passing out your invitation. 
There ain't going to be a bigger party than the one we have in heaven. So why are we so reluctant and so hesitant to invite people into the presence of God? Do you not think the presence of God exi- uh, uh, resides here at Cornerstone Church? I know it does. I'm feeling him right now. Okay. We are called to love and to go to work. Now, don't get me wrong. I said this in the very first message. Sitting here in Cornerstone Church is not going to get you into heaven. It's not going to get you. It's not going to save you. You've got to be, Jesus is the only way. Jesus saves us. But once he saves us, that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of eternity. And he calls us to do certain things. And the most important is to worship him, praise him, and glorify him. And then the second is to invite others into a relationship with him. Now, if you don't think people can find a relationship with Jesus in a cornerstone church, you go somewhere else. Probably never hear another pastor in the United States of America say that. But we are to stir each other up to love. And if there's any other stirring going on, take that out of here. Take that out of here. Or kick it out of here. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, here's probably the most popular verse about coming together as God's people. And or or not forsaking. That means leave behind. And there is a movement. I don't know how strong it is, but you see it a little. I'll see it when I'm scrolling on on online stuff and, and, and you'll see why people don't attend church anymore. Why people hate going to church, blah, blah, blah. The top 10 reasons not to go to church, right? So you see that from time to time. There is this movement. I don't know how strong it is, but there is this movement to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so what does that mean? Forsake means to leave behind. They're saying there there, there is this this certain uh, thought that this isn't important. I'm going to tell you right now it is important. Will it save you? No. Only Jesus can do that. But coming together, loving each other, stirring each other up to good works. Hopefully this is not a a toe-smashing message. Hopefully this is a motivational message to get out there and put some more rubber balls in the jar. Right? Because what we do in here, number one, it's a privilege, not a right. It's a privilege. Three years ago, we lost that privilege for a bit. And I hated every minute of it. I'm going to stand here and tell you this morning, short of being put in jail, the doors of this church will never be locked again. Will never be locked again. If you don't feel good, stay home. If you feel good, come worship God. Come worship God. And you can worship where you're at. You can worship anywhere. But there's something powerful about God's people coming together in one mind, in one voice, and lifting up his name, his name. That's why Jesus set up the church. And and, and not forsaking the assembling. Did he say not forsaking the attendance? He said not forsaking the assembling. All right, men, how many of you have ever assembled anything? Ladies, how many of you have ever assembled anything? Right, get the instructions. Us men, we throw those in the trash. You ladies, you read them word for word. You ladies, when you get done assembling, you have no extra parts. Us men, when we get done assembling, we got parts all over the place. Right? I wasn't needed. That was just a suggestion. Some guy in a factory didn't. Some engineer behind the desk didn't know what he's talking about. I'm out here making it happen. Right? Right? Ah, oh, those are just extras. Amy asked me all the time, what's all these parts laying? Ah, wow, they're just extra. <laughs> Assembling is bringing pieces together to complete something. Church is more than just an attendance. That's why we don't do the old attendance drives here anymore. You get the little pins and the buttons and all that stuff. Remember that? Come on now. 
I don't do that anymore. Why? Because church is more than attendance. Church is, is an assembly of God's people. And so that's how important you are. That's how important you are. You're an assembly part or person into God's family. And it takes all the parts. Come on, this is deep, man. Yeah, those of you that want something deep, this is deep. You ever thought about that word assembly like this? Man, I was about to jump through my office. I'm surprised Keaton didn't hear me running around in my office when God was giving me this. Sound like a rat in a wall in there. God is bringing together, and he's still adding pieces. Cornerstone Church ain't complete. Cornerstone Church ain't complete. He's still got pieces out there that he wants to add. And maybe that piece is going to receive that card that you got. Huh? And the thing is, the thing is, Cornerstone Church needs every piece that God has planned for it. We need you. God doesn't need us. God wants us. But each other, we need each other. We need each other. You have a part and a purpose in the assembly. You might be the nut and bolt. You might be the glue. So let's think about that. You might be the prayer warrior. huh? You might be the one late at night when you can't sleep that's lifting up your brother or sister in Christ. When you pray for the church, that's what you're doing. You can pray for the, the, the name of Cornerstone, but when you pray for Cornerstone, we're praying for each other. We're praying for each other. We need prayer warriors. We need, we need, I need prayer warriors. I need you to pray for me, please. I'm begging you. Pray for me that God's, the high priest will give me his vision totally and completely and clearly. I don't care about my vision. I don't care what I want. I only want what God wants. Because if we build on my vision and what I want, it'll crumble. And that's how you get a shell of a church. I've been to churches that are just a shell of themselves. Because at some point they left the foundation that is Jesus Christ and man's thoughts and opinions or woman's thoughts and opinions become more important. Become more important. And so here, not forsaking the assembly. The assembly. It, we, Cornerstone Church needs each and every one of you. So that we can love and stir each other up to good works. And, and is it always going to be perfect? No. No. I said this last week and I stand by this statement. If you want to come challenge me, come challenge me. I can tell you some stories, and I'll leave the names out to protect the people involved. <laughs> I doubt that there's anybody in this room that has seen more church hurt than Amy and I. Whether it was done directly to us, or we've just seen it done to other people. And I'm going to be transparent. In 17 years of ministry, there's probably some times when I've caused some church hurt. But we can't use that as an excuse to stop loving each other. And that's where the consideration of others comes in. Because that person that caused church hurt, you may not know where they're at in that moment in their life. You may not know what they're struggling with or what they're dealing with. Or what they're having to go through. You might have just sadly been the, the one in the line of fire. In the line of fire. But sometimes we use church hurt as a disguise or a cover up for something deeper that's going on with ourselves. And it really has nothing to do with God's people, it has everything to do with our relationship with Jesus. Not forsaking. The assembly, the putting together, the building. What did he say? Upon this rock, I will build my church. When you build something, what do you do? You assemble it. You assemble it. And God is assembling still today, 2023, his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he is adding you, he's adding me, 
He's got other pieces that we and people we haven't even met yet that he's adding to his church. That he's adding to this to his church because he's got works for us to do. What are those works? Stir each other up to love. Who is love? Jesus is love. What are we supposed to be stirring each other up to? Jesus. Jesus. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. You know what that tells me? There were some that weren't participating even in this time in which Hebrews was written. That it was something that they faced as well. There is nothing new under the sun that you and I will face that hasn't already been faced. We think some of this stuff's going on is brand new. No, it ain't. It's been around for a long, long time. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. And here's the thing. I like that song that we play in the bumper video. There's been times when I, specifically when I was being called to preach, you can ask Amy, I did not want to go to church. I did not want to go to church when I was being called to preach. I would find every excuse in the book to say, yeah, old, the old tummy's hurting today. Got the old quick steps. <laughs> I'll get, Amy will pull me aside afterwards and say that was inappropriate, just so you know. <laughs> Got a headache. I'm exhausted. It's been a tough day at work. I found every excuse in the book to run from the presence of God. But guess what? You can't outrun the presence of God. You can't outrun the presence of God. As a manner of some was. But exhorting exhorting, lifting up, encouraging one another. That's why this is so important. And I said this last week, and I'll probably say this 50 more times before this series is over. I get encouraged being around you all. I didn't get encouraged hearing you sing praises to the Lord. I get encouraged of praying with you and you praying with me. Like I said, this is one of my favorite days of the week. Because I get to be here and I get to be with other people that love Jesus. And I am so thankful that we have a gathering of people, ecclesia, a church of people that love Jesus. That love Jesus. I love family camp. I love family camp. We had a, uh, we had a big glow party. Those of you that are there know what I'm talking about. There might have even been some dancing going on. <gasps> we all going to hell on that one. It was amazing. And, 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 and I get a picture of, of heaven being like that. Just free. Dancing, singing around the throne of Jesus for eternity. You talk about a glow party. The sun will be glowing, not the S-U-N, the S-O-N. There won't need to be an S-U-N in heaven because the S-O-N will be glowing so brightly. I want to be there. I've got an invitation to that party. I've got an invitation. Me, I'm a nobody. I'm a guy that ran from God's call for years. And made people miserable in my path. Now I get to make you miserable, but it's God's calling. <laughs> but I'm thankful for the invitation. I'm thankful he didn't give up. That person that you're inviting, that may make fun of you, that may give you the cold shoulder, that may not talk to you for three weeks, a month, after you invite them, don't stop. Don't give up. Jesus didn't give up on me, didn't give up on you. Don't give up on them. Continue to invite. Continue to seek. Exhorting one another so much the more 
as you see the day approaching. What day? Not next week. The day approaching. The day approaching, when I say not next week, I'm talking about our back to church Sunday. The day approaching is that thing that we haven't experienced yet, that we're marching around the walls so that we can't experience it. One of these days, Jesus is coming back. Another thing I read on the internet, it's going to be in September, by the way, in case y'all didn't know. Just kidding. Some of you is like, <gasps> another thing that this, this begins to speak about in verse 26 is apostasy. And I might have just done that if I'd, have, if I'd have tried to sell you a bill of goods on Jesus coming back in September. I hope he, I hope he does. Be great. You don't have to mess with this anymore. You don't have to listen to me anymore. We just go dance around the throne of Jesus and have a glow party. <laughs> And have a glow party. But one of these days, the day is approaching. The day is approaching when each and every one of us will meet Jesus. Whether it be when we lay this body down or Jesus returns for the final time. That day is approaching. In one of two ways. And it's approaching quickly. It's approaching quickly. First question I have to ask, are you a part of God's family? Have you accepted the invitation to be a part of God's family? Have you accepted that? If you can't leave here 100% certain that you've accepted that, you have your invitation to the party today. You have your invitation to the party today. And I know the enemy's going to try and put all kinds of lies and all kinds of thoughts to try and stop you, to try and cause you to waver from accepting Christ and being in relationship with Him. Don't buy into that lie. The truth is, there's a family of God right here that will come and pray with you. And we don't have to tell each other, see, the great thing about the veil being torn, I don't, I don't have to tell you my my skeletons in the closet and you don't have to tell me and we don't have to tell each other now if God so leads you to find somebody that you trust to do that so be it but if not he already knows and sometimes he just wants you to confess to him and an abundance of forgiveness and love and grace and mercy is available to you that's the invitation the greatest party that could ever be is approaching and each and every one of us have an invitation to be a part of the family of God. Don't walk away from your invitation. Don't walk away from your invitation. Maybe your relationship is strong. Maybe you're a, a, a strong part of God's family. You're the glue holding some of it together. You're the nut. You're the bolt. You're the screw. You're the wrench or the hammer. Whatever it may be. Maybe you just want to come and pray that God continues to use you and reveal to you exactly how you can consider your other brother and sister in Christ and how you can stir up good works in His family. In His family. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much today for Your Word, for Your message. We thank You so much for the family of God that we get to be a part of. We thank you for uh, your church. We thank you, Jesus, for being the foundation of your church. We ask now, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, if there's someone that has not accepted their invitation to be in your family, that you would speak to them right now this very moment. Hopefully you've been speaking to them this entire service, Lord, that you'd give them the, the, the courage to step forward and to come and to, to receive you. Lord, help us as God's people to get up and to go out and to move and to, and to work and to do the things that you've called us to do in our lives so that we can be the body that you've called us to be, that you desire for us to be, so that we can see others receive you, so that we can be strengthened within our spirit to not waver in our hope and in our faith. And we will give you the glory and the honor for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.